<laughs> okay, so last time we looked at how to do multi-core using threads, and uh, there's uh, <coughs> there's there's this key fundamental flaw with threads that they share everything. Everything in memory is shared by default, which is uh, t uh, this is hard and. Uh, t uh, it's actually really difficult in a big program to make sure that everybody is working on their own stuff and not messing up other people's stuff as they run. Uh, just really hard to enforce that. So to, to me, I mean, this this feels like oversharing, right? This is the, the modern uh, disease. And uh, I, I feel like actually processes, so, so the, the, essentially on Linux especially, the only difference between a thread and a process is whether you share memory or not. And, and uh, the, the, so, so the question is, what are the advantages to sharing memory? that you wouldn't get if you made processes. Yeah, so so this is uh, this is a little bit annoying. Oh, we have, we were down to one orange marker. There are now zero markers. So that's that's cool. That uh, that was a bad idea. Anyway, I'll use my fingers. <laughs> so, uh, I got two processes. If, uh, if this is the same data on both processes, it's actually kind of silly to have two separate copies of it because you've loaded it up as two separate processes. Uh, cool, cool thing about, uh, t uh, I mean, we, we, we mentioned a little bit about how uh, the OS does all sorts of funny things with the page table. In particular, uh, uh, if you, so in Unix, you make new processes by copying old processes. So you start with one process, actually, so machine boots, loads the kernel. Kernel fires off the first process, this process one, called a nit. Uh, th th that, is, that is the last process the kernel creates. Everything else it does by just fork, so it divides like bacteria. And then uh, uh, now you have two independent ones, and then one of them can go and exact some other uh, code. But basically, the, so, so a key operation in, uh, uh, in Linux process creation is, is called fork. And, and fork has a really, I mean, it's, uh, you look at the man page for fork, there's almost nothing there. It's like fork. Oh, it takes no arguments because you are the argument. The whole program is like an argument to fork, right? Uh, it, it returns the process ID of the newly created thing. Now, uh, Unix is really old. It's from the 70s, back when machines were really slow. Uh, it would be a really bad idea to literally make a copy of all the data in a running program. In particular, if a big program like a web browser needs to fire off a process to do something simple like run a plug-in or fire up a new tab, like literally copying all the data in the web browser would be a really expensive operation. So they don't do that. Uh, so, so, so by default, uh, uh, almost all Unix systems are copy on write. So in other words, you had one copy of the data, it's read-write. You fork. It actually leaves it being one copy and it marks it read only. As soon as somebody starts writing to something, it actually split the copy and now I've got my copy, you've got your copy, and then it, now it's writable again. So, so the, the, the weird part about this is if you, uh, uh, if you spawn all of your what would be threads, but you spawn off processes, it's actually relatively cheap, right? It's, 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 it's not a real slow operation uh, to do this. Because uh, essentially, it's just marking the whole page table as being read-only, but uh, un unless somebody wants to write to it, and then make separate copies. So, so, it, uh, so, so and, and uh, Unix systems do fork a lot. So, fork is actually pretty dang fast. It's actually uh, uh, time competitive with creating threads, which is kind of surprising. Uh, so let's uh, let's do this. So essentially, like uh, unistd.h, this is one downside with this is that uh, all of the all the fork stuff is Unix specific. It is not there on Windows. W Windows makes processes with a, a, a totally different uh, interface called create process, which at some point we ought to look at, or maybe uh, maybe I'll, I'll save that for your presentation or something. It's it's. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't work this way. So it's uh, it's not uh, not very easy to use, honestly. Uh, fork is really easy to use. You call fork. You are now a new process. So if you look at how this, so fork is a weird one that you call it one time, and it returns twice. So one of these. Uh, so so the only difference between the two forked copies is the return value from fork. Right up to the fork, they're the same. After the fork, they're the same, except that uh, the parent. In other words, the original process got uh, 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 the process ID of the child, and the child got a special process ID of zero, saying, uh, you know, you're the child. So the, the usual way you call this is that you say, uh, uh, so what's, what's my PID? And if PID equals zero, that means you're the child. So now you get to do child work, so I can see, uh, like, uh, I am the child. 
So I'm the child process, and then hopefully you know what to do. In this case, I'm just going to return, uh, and uh, otherwise I know I'm the parent. So I, I have, for example, I have my child's process ID there. So, uh, created child. So the, the, there, there I have the child process ID. So if if I need to, uh, you know, do 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 some work uh, there, then I can I can totally do that. And uh, I should have returned. So basically, uh, child process is created. Here's the child. Let's see one of these. Oh, that that's the parent uh, not returning anything. So let, let me return one from the parent so we know what we're looking at. So parent is going to say I created the child. Uh, I am parent. I created the child. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's uh, uh, once you, if you carbon copy two processes, it's not even clear like uh, if, who, who created the child. Like there was, there was one process and now there are two of us. So that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's a difference. I, I guess uh, I, I'm the child, I created myself. Uh, so so it, it, essentially like the, the, the return paths are, are uh, the same. Now the, the hard part about this is once you have forked, I mean it's called fork because it's kind of like there was one and now there are two. You have divided uh, the process stream into two halves. So, uh, how do you exchange data? How do you communicate? Uh, well, so, so yeah, you, you, so you need something that's shared between the process. So files are shared. Uh, a named file called, is uh, called a pipe uh, is one way to do uh, uh, communication. That's really Unixy. I almost never use pipes. How uh, what what other what other stuff do you need in order to, to synchronize these two? So, so in particular, if, if you compare this to making threads, right? Uh, fork is the equivalent of create you know standard thread. Uh, you don't have to so you make a standard thread, you have to pass it what function to run. Uh, you make a new process, you don't have to say what function to run because you are the function. It's already uh, it's going to be the rest of this code. Uh, so, so what else do you want to do on threads? What's the usual list of operations we need? Oh, we do need a join. So here, I'm the, so you notice here, I'm the parent, I created the child, and then the parent just returns with the, the child hasn't even really started yet. Uh, so the, uh, the, 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 the way you join is, uh, is, is, it's called wait. So it's in sys wait. So this is uh, for wait PID. And uh, the, the one you want to use is actually called wait PID, so you're waiting for a process. So, so here the parent is going to wait for the child to finish. So, so essentially, uh, uh, during the seeouts here, both of them are running at the same time. I, I'm going to do a wait to, uh, to, to uh, basically join up these two uh, threads, of, threads of execution. So I'm going to wait until the child exits. So I just call uh, wait PID, and uh, I'm going to pass the process ID. I guess uh, the, uh, I get the child's uh, exit status. Here's the exit code, and then there's there's a bunch of flags you can pass into wait PID. Uh, so, uh, so so wait PID just says who you want to wait for, and uh, it'll return an error. So if if and if you want to look at what these things are, then uh, wait PID is a thing. Oh, it return it returns the PID. That's weird. I I know you can do wait PID minus one. And that waits for any process ID, so you can ask who, who you're waiting for. So I think I'm going to call wait PID with the, the child PID. So essentially, wait for the child to exit and uh, see, see what they returned. So, uh, so child has exited. So I, I know that now, and I should be using endel for this, because uh, otherwise the uh, see, it, see it will cache the output, buffer the output. So um, it may make the prints kind of hard to figure out. So I am the child. So here's the child finishing. And then here's the, so the parent has actually just been stuck there from, you know, saying I created the child to waiting for the child to actually finish. Uh, th th there's, <laughs> there's a bunch of weird and amusing terminology for this. If uh, uh, once the child has exited, someone has to wait for it. If no one collects its exit, co exit code, the, the process is called a zombie which is weird. It's waiting for someone to mourn the loss of the process. Uh, if, uh, and yeah, a, a lot of stuff doesn't work right for zombie processes. It's uh, strange. Uh, so you, you, you do want to make sure that you call wait PD, just like you should join your threads, right? You fire off threads, you need to join them, or weird, uh, actually timing dependent stuff tends to happen. Yes? So when you fork a process, is it possible to fork a process and give the second process your initial 
process ID? Mm, I think you retain your process ID, but but uh, honestly, which one's which is kind of. Uh, well, I'm uh, not having a transfer yeah. process ID, so mm. the secondary process has the same process ID as you. Knows who you are. Oh, uh, oh, what sure, yeah. So ID? here's how you do this: the parent, you want the parent process ID, you oh. call get PID. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, because anything you do up to the fork is shared by the child, right? So I'm the child. My parent, uh, parent was. Uh, so here's my parent process ID. So yeah, if you want to blast signals back and forth, uh, that'd be a totally legit way to do it. So so you can, I mean, it's it. That f f fork is fork is honestly beautiful, right? Like uh, not a lot of beautiful things came in the '70s, but this is one of them. Yes. So when you send a signal, do you have to collect the exit code or the zombie process or maybe? What is what yeah. Is I think I, actually, I, I, to total speculation, I, I, uh, I should I should know this. Uh, I think the exit code actually gets stored in the tra task struct, and uh, the kernel doesn't delete the task struct until someone has grabbed that exit code. So un until somebody calls wait PD, I, I think there's like a leak in the process because actually the processes still show up in the list, right? You do a PS and you see these zombie processes that are like they have nothing left but their exit code and they just want to give it to somebody. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's why they have the little zombie. I mean, the zombie process of tracking is a little weird uh, sort of thing. Yes. So it's, like it's it's the child processes that become zombies. Child children become zombies that's, unless yeah, somebody uh, waits for them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, it is. Okay, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I'm working on my web server project to test to test like I create child processes to access yeah. clients yeah. or maybe access servers, I can't remember. Yeah. But then I just kill them when they're done. Yeah. Maybe they're just sitting around. Well, so when when you exit uh, any any so so, so now there's the, the, there's this whole tree of like who created the process. There's the parent process. So the the parent is recorded as the one that we're supposed to be waiting for probably, uh, and and but then if the parent exits, then essentially all of the all the little orphans get uh, 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 shuffled off to init. Actually, takes care of them, and it, it just automatic. It just auto waits. Does a wait minus one. I think you're okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, it's 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 easy enough to check because if you just do a PS, you should have basically no zombies, right? And I, I think it's actually like top shows you. Oh, I got a zombie. That's cool. I wonder which. Uh, so. you actually had it, like, HP upgrade is defunct. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> so I got to. Uh, I, I think that is there a command. Oh, there is a wait. 35. So this is like uh, what bleach or something. Uh, oh, wait is not a child of this well. Okay, it is now. Uh, there's a well. What? I I think when you do sudo, it runs to bin sh not bash. Sure. I, I, I suspect there's some way to just wait for. Uh, yeah, this is this is weird. So the, the the way you take care of zombies is just like mourn their loss, and then then they're fine. Their uh, their spirit is released or something. Uh, what the heck is wait? Um, it's hard to kill zombies. <laughs> so uh, I mean, it's it's owned by me. This should, you'd think this would work. Uh, see if we got them. Yeah, killing them doesn't work because they're already dead, right? Um, I, I, I think, so kill minus nine might work. So kill minus nine is the special, no. Nope. Like, uh, it's a weird situation to be in. It, it, it's possible I was like literally printing something uh, and then the HP upgrade was like trying to mess with the printer and uh, I unplugged the printer. That really ticks off the, 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 so the kernel has all of this sort of like checking to uh, make sure that Hardware devices get you know removed properly, and if you don't go through that properly, it's it's easy to end up with processes that are kind of wedged in some. So, so this this may be a zombie because the kernel won't let it die. It's like no, the printer you connected to the printer, and then it hasn't like disconnected correctly. So that's uh, 
Yeah. Uh, this this makes me wonder if I sh if I could ri just write a, pro a quick little program. So here's like the, the killer dot c, and it's basically just uh, so all I gotta have there is uh, unist or sys wait, and its whole job is to just kill this one process. So it's just gonna call wait. PID. I, I, I bet it won't work because uh, it's not marked as a child. So, actually, w w what I should do is figure out who who is the parent of that one. So, uh, I mean, if if uh, thirty five, eighty nine. Well, it's a ch ch child is relative. Oh. Like yeah. Uh, so wh whoever created this thing. You're not the I'm not the parent. It's a child of somebody. Yeah. Well, if I understand everything, you tell it. No. Un unattended children turn into zombies, and that's no good. Yeah. Uh, that's th that's why they're like, uh, uh, let's see, such a big deal. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I'm I'm gonna just try to wait for it. I, I don't know if this is gonna help, but. Uh, So I oh I do need its exit code, and uh, I'll just see if uh, see if that works. Uh, so the exit code. I I I bet you it's gonna I, I bet this isn't gonna work for some weird reason. So yeah. Still there. Yeah, and uh, so I guess here. I shouldn't be doing this now, but uh, here I am. <laughs> so the, the PID it returns is probably negative one because something something. So if PID is less than zero, yeah, less than, I think zero is not a valid PID because one is the first one. So I'm going to P error. No child processes. You, yeah, you can't do it because it's not your child. There's there, there there's some way to figure out whose child this is and yeah like hey Th their parent must be alive because otherwise they would have been reassigned to be uh, to, uh, in nits. So at some point you have to just reboot. I mean that uh, that solves all problems. So, uh, right. So, w w waiting. Th there's th th there are weird ways that this goes wrong. But basically, like this is equivalent to a thread join. So, like thread join. That, that's the idea. So, I, I fork. We are running simultaneously now. So, you can literally do multi-processing stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to do some actual parallel processing and benchmark some of these things in a sec. So, the 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 one thing we need is we need the ability to actually do communication. So, so I can I can get the exit code. Back. So, for example, here, uh, if if the child goes ahead and exits with uh, the exit code is only like eight bits wide, so I can say exit code seven or something, and then uh, somewhere in this exit code there is so exited with code. You need the exit status of the exit code, so that there's there's a macro to pull out the actual exit code, and that's probably not the name of it. I haven't done this often enough. Uh, oh. Okay. Hole in one, so uh, yeah. So, so I can I can get eight bits out of the child to the parent via the exit code that's clearly not designed to store lots like lots of data. So I, I could write a file from the child and then read it in the parent. That's super duper common. Actually, it's uh, it's kind of a shell scripty way to get things done. It uh, it's not really that fast. It's not a very high performance way to do things. And and this is why uh, I mean most people do multi core with threads. Because sharing data in memory is just clearly inherently more efficient, right? You, you know, you, you can I can blast something into memory. The other person can pull it right out of memory. We can see you know, bidirectional communication, very very you know, like a nanosecond level exchanges. Instead of having to call the OS to say put some data in a file, and the OS is like directories, permissions, like all of the you know the madness of getting data in a file. Uh, that's that's just kind of inherently inefficient. So this technique I'm showing you of like fork to do multiprocessing, no one does it. They're like, no, it's just inefficient. You can't can't exchange data with files. Uh, it, p pipes are another way to exchange data, but pipes are still OS involved. You have less file system overhead. Is there some way that we could share data between parent and child uh, that's still in memory? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah. So the, the uh, uh, if you if if you look at MMAP, one of the things in MMAP, and it's near the end where you're getting bored. Uh, it was map shared versus map private. So essentially, like th th these are the two options, and most stuff is map private. So updates to the mapping are not visible to other processes. They're not carried through the unknown file. Like, uh, yeah, uh, map shared shares the mapping, which is a little bit weird. And uh, well, you can you can manually control this apparently. Uh, map shared, uh, as long as I map shared but before forking, that shared data is actually still shared even after the fork, which is a little weird. Does, that, does this make sense? So this, uh, so I, I keep looking for somebody that does this or somebody that's described this, but as far as I know, this is a Lawler technique. It, it, it can't be because, like, I mean, MMAP is a totally common. So here, here, here's the shared memory region, and I can I can make it I can give it any type I want. So here, here's the thing we share is uh, it's going to be from MMAP, and uh, I'm going to not suggest where it wants it. I'm going to uh, basically have a one page uh, of shared data. You can have as much data as you want. Uh, I, I want to do want to be able to uh, read and write and ex uh, potentially execute. So I'm going to approach read, approach write. Actually, I, sh I shouldn't do exact. I always do exact just out of uh, habit. So do, do, like re read and writable data, and I want map shared. And uh, oh, and th these should be bitwise or. Uh, let's see, and that uh, uh, I, I just want anonymous data. I don't want a file. So the file descriptor part of uh, MMAP is going to be minus one, and the offset is zero. So hopefully this actually allocated some shared data because uh, it's read-write and it's shared between parent and child. Hopefully I can put data in from the child and it changes in the parent. And this is unlike everything else in memory, right? If, if I have global variables, they are local to your process, right? And once you fork, you have two separate copies of the globals. Uh, which is really good. This is a huge feature. It means you can't accidentally step on somebody else's uh, t uh, static variables, global variables, like the single copy, a singleton copy of the object that uh, you didn't even realize was in the class doing something stupid. Uh, th th that stuff sort of breaks multi-thread code all the time. I, I, I've hit this like literally dozens of times in, in uh, uh, different projects, and it's it's always annoying because you find out because the program crashes or it silently gives the wrong answer or. Uh, I, actually, I kind of suspect there's stuff that, uh, that right. Anytime I use threads, I'm paranoid about like what am I accidentally sharing. Uh, and the nice part about processes is this is literally the only thing that can be shared, is uh, is, is the data I explicitly allocate to be shared. So b basic idea is uh, I should be able to write some data in here. So let's just figure out if we can do it. So I'm going to put. Uh, I guess uh, the the original copy when there was only one of us, I initialize it to zero. Uh, the child is going to set it to one, two, three, and then exit. And then after the child has exited, hopefully the parent is going to see the new value. So I look at uh, what uh, so child wrote. So I into the shared region, I got the shared data. Uh, and uh, let's see if that worked. Probably not because I forgot sysmman. Yeah. Never heard of pro read or pro write because so all that stuff is in another header. This and then dot h. So this is no easy scroll bar. Questions? Okay, so that that works. Now what what what's happening? <laughs> Gotta like zoom out to even see. So b basic idea. I allocate a page, the special page in my memory that once we fork, that page is sort of this umbilical that connects parent and child. And uh, this is uh, this is totally a thing you can do. You can allocate you can allocate several of them. They're all shared. You can read and write it. And un un unlike the, I mean, it, in actuality, everything's like that. As soon as you write to it, you'll get separate copies. Question. Right. So let me see if I understand this. So if you didn't do the share, then you just allocate. Yeah. So, so yeah. So so if if I make a new int. Right, so it's just uh, a pointer to an int living in memory. It works exactly the same. Like, uh, you know, I can set it to zero as the parent. The child sets their copy. It's the same pointer, which is a little confusing. Uh, but the, so, so now the child, like I, uh, the parent, is not reading the child value now, just because this memory is just normal memory. And uh, when when I read it in the parent, I'm getting a separate copy because at the point of the fork, we copy all of RAM, at least in principle. 
M map is a magical thing. Yeah. And, 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 and the trick is, I said map shared, which means I want this mapping shared between anyone that uh, ends up uh, accessing it. In particular, even me. It, uh, I should say it. Uh, I still it still fails if you do map private, which is which is the default. Actually, if uh, you know, there, there's a ton of M maps to bring in shared libraries and to allocate RAM and stuff. Those are all private. So you you fork, they're they're uh, they are not shared. So you got to do a shared, and then uh, we have communication. Yes. Uh, so just backing up a little bit, uh, you said this is kind of an inefficient way to do things. Uh, more secure. Well, so, so, so the question is, what, is, what efficiency do we get here? So uh, fork is a little slower than making threads. Once they're running, they're separate processes, which I claim is basically like you know, s s switching. Like these two processes could actually live on separate cores and just hammer away on their cores and live their lives. And, and in that case, it's exactly equivalent to threads. Uh, if they want to exchange data, instead of having to go through the file system, they're just blasting stuff into RAM. Right? So this is literally a write to an int. And that's as fast as any write to an int. And then uh, th this is reading an int. So that's as fast as any read of an int. And, and in fact, uh, so, so th this technique actually makes processes as efficient at exchanging data as threads without having the accidental oversharing. Yeah. So, so two things. Can you yeah. save this? Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's in the lecture notes. Uh, okay. yeah. uh, so we get to four. Is, so, is, so is this lecture an alternative to threads or just a? This is a replacement for threads. Ah, th th I'm I'm getting excited about saying like this is Dr. Lawler's replacement for threads. This is the because uh, uh, I, I I need to I, so we'll validate this here with the, writing some actual code and we, we can benchmark this head head to head see what uh, my suspicion is it's probably might might not be as efficient as threads but it's it's hard to say yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying correctly. Instead of having the entire thing memory share, you now have this little part of memory share. Yes. So where does it lead to overwriting your memory? I don't see the solution. Oh, uh, so, so, so you still got to be careful about like how you update the shared area. That's exactly like multiple threads. So you may actually have to have like locks, for example, to make sure that you're not uh, updating the same data at the same time. It's, it's only a solution for the accidentally sharing data, which happens a lot with threads, right? I, I get some, so I'm calling a library to read a JPEG. I'm like, sure, I read a JPEG. What's the problem? The problem is the read a JPEG library stores a global to store the error handler, which is really stupid. Uh, th this is actually a never ending source of security bugs, in particular in web browsers, which call a billion existing shared libraries, do all sorts of complicated processing, and are, everything they do is security critical. Uh, one, one huge, so, so standard problem is use after delete. So in other words, one thread allocates some data. Uh, the, the data ends up getting shared to another thread. The other thread deletes it while the first thread is accessing it. So, so the, 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 there's, there's a, so, so, so the, uh, the, the problem is basically, uh, if, if, if there's any chance that, uh, that, that basically uh, uh, malicious JavaScript could make a bunch of threads and then try and uh, be doing some interesting thing with objects on the screen, uh, that, that uh, if, 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 so if, if malicious JavaScript can get can set up so that you'd have deleted an object while some other thread is writing to it, you can actually end up writing to arbitrary memory, which is kind of surprising. It's usually not very reliable. So it's like it's usually like banner ads that will do this, and they're just spamming. Create the object, delete it, and try and write through it. No, nope, failed. Del create the object, delete it, and try and write through it. Right, and uh, it's it's weird because it only has to work one out of every thousand times, and they can overwrite arbitrary memory, which is a problem because they can just try millions of times and overwrite anything they want, and and literally take over your machine by, because of one multi-thread unsafe write, which is weird. Uh, so, so, so this is this is a, this is honestly a, a, a huge problem. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, you're comparing Can create uh, so, so th there is an equivalent to MMAP on Windows that can be used to do the same thing of creating a little shared memory region between processes. How 
how many parameters yeah. does that take? A lot. And it, uh, to get those parameters, you have to call other things. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's, it's totally, I guess, so in, in lecture notes, I've got linked to So you create a file mapping and then map view file. It, it, essentially, this is just an overgrown version of the file, like write data to a file and then read it from the file from another uh, uh, process. That's, that's, that's like every program in existence, right? Your, your 201, uh, to CS201 homework, where basically it's like, start up and read up, uh, read some data. If that data was written by another program, that's actually just communication with the other program, right? So this is essentially just a faster version of that that, uh, that all, all lives in RAM. Okay, so questions? So uh, the, 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 the real question, I honestly don't know, how fast is this and can we make it be as fast as uh, uh, threads? So uh, lots of possible things we could uh, we could time with this. Actually, I'm I'm really tempted to do the the uh, rendering. So Mandelbrot set rendering. So that's this cool uh, you know this 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 cool image is created uh, mathematically. So basically, I loop over the pixels of the image, and I draw one pixel of the Mandelbrot set image by doing some math. And uh, yeah, honestly, like it uh, doesn't really matter uh, as far as the performance benchmarking, what the math is. Its whole job is to draw one pixel of an image. I, I, if, if you recall, we, we benchmarked this on the CPU versus the GPU, and spoiler, the GPU won. Uh, so it, it, it turns out, uh, so single core, this takes 97 nan or 79 nanoseconds per pixel. And uh, that, that, okay, fine, like there's, there's a lot happening in that image, so that's, uh, that's, that's a thing. So essentially, I guess I can copy data one way or another. So here's what I'm going to try. So here's like the, uh, here's the, I don't know what to call these. We can call these Lawler threads. The Lawler pipe. I, I don't know. What, yeah. uh, it's, it's, and in fact, probably somebody else has already written it up and it might be there's some fatal flaw in it. Uh, so we, uh, t uh, so I, I guess, so this is like the, this is the great uh, t uh, thread bench. So this is the serial code that runs on the CPU. I guess uh, let's let's do the uh, the two threads version first. So threads. So I I, I want to make a separate thread to render half the image. Which half is an obvious question. So how do we how do we do this? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally plausible. Yeah, sure. Let's let's do that. It uh, uh, one one problem with top and the bottom is that uh, if the top, so I think in this case, the top actually has a lot more going on than the bottom. But that's uh, that's that's legit. So so th this is probably where we're not going to quite get a twofold speed up, but uh, we can solve that problem later. So let's see. So what I want is I want half of these loops. So half the iterations of this loop are going to be running in a, in a separate function and the, that, that separate function is going to be doing the drawing. So draw Mendel brought. Uh, let's see. So, that, so, so this is going to be hopefully some part of the loop. So I, I guess I could do y start to y end. And let's see, so I could pass the width and height and the pixel data. I'm actually tempted to do the following, which looks a little ugly, but uh, it's a global. Uh, you, you notice you're not supposed to use globals with threads. Super evil, but I'm doing it anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it here because uh, I actually want to share the image between, uh, between the two threads, right? That, that's, that's the whole point, is uh, we're trying to draw part of the same image. So trying to, uh, to try and do that render. So let's see, so I just want to start at uh, Y start and go to uh, Y end. I guess I, I, should, I should just double check that my draw, it doesn't even matter this Mandel brought now. So draw image is going to take some of the Ys. So it's going to go from basically zero to the height of the image. And it, and it should just double check to see that that doesn't really change the time. I think that might change the time. Let's find out. Uh, no, so, so uh, same, same time if I do it that way, great. Okay, so let's make some threads. And essentially, all I'm going to do is I'm going to make a standard thread to do the image. So there's my thread. It's going to be drawing the image. And then this is a little bit weird. I want the thread to run draw image with the parameters of 0 to height over 2. So once, once that thread is created and spawned off and running, then I need to draw the rest of the image. So I'm going to draw height over 2 to height. And then I guess I need to join afterwards. 
that make sense? Okay, so I probably need uh, thread. So 79 nanoseconds, the time to beat. We do two threads. It's probably not going to be twofold faster. Yeah, it's. Uh, this is this is definitely a problem with. Uh, if if you split up an image that has a real bad like uh, uh, top bottom asymmetry, so that that's faster. <laughs> yes. All right. So, <laughs> well, we can't like create a lot of threads. So. Could, I'd like to take stick with two just to yeah, start with here. Excellent idea. So what I'm going to do is everybody's going to go from zero to height, or it's, it's uh, so we're going to have a phase and a jump. So you're going to start at your phase and you're going to move by jump. So f f phase zero, jump one, just does all the pixels. Phase zero, jump two, does the evens, right? Phase zero, jump five, does every fifth row. So uh, hopefully jump isn't a keyword. So let's see. So we got phase zero, jump two, and phase one, jump two. So the, the, the nice part is instead of I do the whole top of the half of the image, you do the whole bottom half of the image, the problem being the top is really complicated and the bottom is really simple. Uh, instead, we're going to do even odd rows, which is a, a better load balance. So this should be a pretty good speed up, hopefully. Okay, yeah, so we went from 79 to 41. That's almost 2x. There's a little, you know, uh, uh, overhead to making the threads, etc. So, I mean, you, getting, getting perfect speed up is, uh, uh, it's hard. Okay, so that was, that was not too bad. Uh, and, and in particular here, we want this image to be shared between processes. Right, that's the whole idea. So how do we do this with these uh, uh, wacky uh, processes? Well, um, my replacement for making a thread is doing the fork. So I'm going to call, uh, let's see, so I need, uh, I need unistd.h. Actually, everything up to now was uh, cross-platform. There isn't a cross-platform interface for this. Until I make it, probably. So this is for fork, and uh, uh, we're going to need uh, we're going to need weight anyway. So sys weight, and uh, for weight PID. So let's see. So uh, I I instead of creating a thread, uh, so I'll I'll just have the the the, the threaded code uh, standardized, nice interface. So let's see. So we what we we have to do is. Uh, do a fork. So do my fork. If uh, the process ID is zero, that means I'm the child process. So I draw image zero two, and then I'm just going to exit. And uh, otherwise, you're the parent. So uh, d the reason I exit instead of just returning here is because uh, the uh, I don't want to draw I, I don't want to like print things out or uh, uh, write stuff to disk if I'm the child. So I basically just create the child process. Pr child child process draws an image, and then the parent is going to simultaneously draw the image. Phase one, two. So this is the odd uh, even rows. This is the odd rows. And then I have to wait for the child to finish. That's the equivalent of thread join. What? Uh, how, how do you do that? Yeah. So wait PID. So to check the process ID of the child, and uh, I don't even need a status code. So I'm just gonna. Uh, so here's the status. I, I forget what these flag. There's a bunch of flags you can pass to wait PID. You don't need any of those. So essentially, this is just like uh, it was basically like join. Okay, uh, what else do I need to do? I, I think I've made a process. They're both working on their stuff. We've uh, hopefully successfully uh, uh, waited for the ch child, so no zombies. So if we try this, so there's, there's two things about this that are interesting. Timing is great. The image, I don't know if that's visible. None of the child work is actually in there. Ah, because the image is stored as just a bunch of data. 
And uh, with threads, we didn't have to worry about this because threads share everything by default. With, uh, if I make separate process, I have to tell the machine when I allocate this that it should be in special shared data area. So instead of just allocating new pixel data, I have to call this magical mmap. We do that. So it's a bunch of pixels. So zero is the address it gets stored to, and this is a size of pixel times the width times the height. So that's the total number of bytes for the buffer. That looks appallingly ugly that clearly cries out for a library to be made, which I guess that's my job. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> it's gone. It's, uh, I, I think it literally is all the even rows, or all the odd rows are probably OK, and all the even rows are missing. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah, no, uninitialized. Yeah, it'll kind of retro. Uh, prot read and prot write are in sysmman.h. That's for mmap. So, uh, try this. So, that that looks like a complete image. This the the code is on the uh, the lecture notes. Timing is like. What what was the timing relative to threads? Pretty much the exact same. Yeah. Sure. The the code is slightly uglier, which just cries out for having a library made to do this. I mean, I, I think this, this may actually be a non-crazy thing. 41.4 versus uh, 41.8. 40, and it took us like three minutes, four minutes, with explaining all the code. Like, it's, I don't know. Uh, it uh, so, so I, I, I like this. I like this technique. This seems uh, seems possible. Uh, in this case, we uh, the parent and child both know what they should do, right? They're they're rendering evens and odd rows beforehand. They don't. Uh, they don't. They're not. There's not much that they actually have to exchange about this stuff. So the, the, there's actually no particular need for locking or anything because basically, like, I got my part of the image I know I need to write to. You got your part of the image you know you need to write to. And we just do our thing, uh, introvert style, right? Like you have divvied up the project successfully, so you never need to communicate again. That's good. That's that's the ideal. <laughs> it, uh, uh, if you have to communicate, if if for example somewhere here there's a uh, uh, so it feels deeply wrong. So I'm I'm gonna actually make a little uh, so make a little utility function called uh, allocate shared or alloc shared. So this takes a size t, the number of bytes to allocate, and it's going to call mmap. So this is how we this is how we allocate this. I mean, how do we make this look uglier? Because <laughs> it's it's uh, it's it looks it looks awful, honestly. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna call malloc shared, and we're just gonna pass the number of bytes. Uh, C programmers think this is relatively okay because they're used to seeing malloc and they're used to having to type cast uh, their allocations. You could overload operator new somehow. I forget how to do that in C++. That's possible. It's a thing. Uh, so you could uh, you could actually you could you could have a new shared or something that would allocate these pixel objects. Uh, okay, I should I should do this. Um, it's got to be templated. Template. Can't even spell template anymore. So, uh, so we're gonna do a T pointer. Here is a new uh, shared, and I, I guess I need the number of them that you wanted to allocate. So it's uh, what size T N things. So, so I, I need to know the number of T's that you want. And you're going to want T's, so I'm just going to basically call. Uh, I'm, so here's where I just do the typecast. You just call the C version. I call malloc shared. I uh, let's see, pull out the number of T's times the size of a T. Okay, so now now instead of having to do that, we should be able to just call new shared new shared pixel. Does, does that make sense? Have you done? C++ that way. Yeah. Can you explain where all the different teams are doing? No. 
No one can. Uh, if if you I don't know C plus plus. It uh, so class T we are templated on the type that we're returning. So the, the whole point of new shared is to allocate stuff. T is the type of the stuff. Oh, all right, so that's passed. That is passed in. Yeah, it's it. And uh, it's, yeah, the, the syntax for templates was clearly just shoehorned in there without really, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was designed to be backward compatible, not to like uh, fit in with the language well. Like, like the uh, this is weird. Yeah, I, I, I honestly have pretty mixed, increasingly mixed feelings about C plus plus as well. Like, I and mean, then there's beautiful things you can do in uh, R A I I, etc. But uh, but there's also just this sort of inherent ugliness to the the syntax and such. Yes. Maybe not the right time and place, but I'm not super comfortable with pointers, and it seems like mm. you're exceptionally comfortable. Like, yeah. Like, what, what is, what is the <laughs> yeah. Here? Like, how can you just view immediately that now it's share was going to be have to be a pointer? And like, just uh, how, how do you get comfortable with knowing when to use pointers and mm. stuff like that? Yeah. Practice, Practice, just do it again and again and again. Yeah. It, uh, so, so, so in, in this case, what I want is I want I, so the whole the whole underlying trick that makes all this stuff work is I'm doing something with memory. Anytime you're doing stuff with memory, you don't want value types because the compiler gets to choose like do they live in registers? Do they go, you know, uh, s s stored off to the stack somewhere? Like uh, so, if if I want to specify where it lives in memory, it has to be pointers. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, c c questions. And, and uh, I mean, if, if you're if you're comfortable with any one of these, like just calling mmap, that's that's sort of what I'm after. And uh, I mean, this is like a C style wrapper for the whole mmap shebang, so I could make it look more like, just like your usual malloc is just shared between all the subsequent processes we might create. Or uh, you know, this is this crazy templated new-ish thing, and it uh, uh, you know it's going to get shared between all the uh, uh, all the processes we create. So you could probably make like a shared vector. I wonder if that really got slower, if that's just a timing fluke. Just a timing fluke, it looks like. Uh, right, so, so quest, questions? Did you make the bomb? Super easy, yes. N Netrun used to be vulnerable to fork bombs. Ah, so uh, uh, fun fun with, uh, with these things. Uh, wow, wh wh what does this program do? <laughs> you have one pro one program comes in and it's like all right let's run foo foo does iteration one of the for loop fork there's now two for loops right so you have boom, boom. I mean it's the exponentially growing number of processes. Actually a lot of machines, so, so they call this a fork bomb because uh, basically once, if you, if you look at the process list, right, like most machines are set up so that if, if you look at like, a, like there's a lot of tabs open, right, uh, and there's a lot of other like OS stuff, so like there's 400 processes running, like whoa, 400. Uh, you make 400 here in like nine iterations. So by the 20th iteration, like all the processes on the machine are you. And uh, basically like if the OS is time slicing, it's just like fork bombing, fork bombing, fork bombing, fork bombing. And it, it eventually theoretically will get to like moving the mouse or pressing control C or letting the sysadmin log in because they're trying to figure out what is wrong with this machine. Eventually, theoretically, we'll get to those, but in practice, it just uh, the, like the, the network connections will time out before it'll actually get there. And essentially, the machine is just doing nothing but this forever. And weirdly hard to uh, like. Are you not allowed to make processes? That means you can't even like uh, you know run a shell or uh, you know. I want to let you fork once or twice, ten times even, but not like an unlimited number of times and certainly not this exponential number of times. So if you try this, this runs for two seconds on that run. No, oh, doesn't run at all. So if fork is in unistd.h. If I bomb myself by accident, how, it, how bad is this? It's, it, so once you reboot, all is forgiven. You, you usually have to reboot, which is kind of weird. Uh, so if you get this to compile, it, uh, two seconds go by. 
And then hopefully Netrun is alive. Okay. That was a little longer than two seconds, I think, but uh, it, it does manage to kill everything off eventually. So this was so uh, there's an R, uh, set R limit where you can s control the number of active processes. So this is this is, so uh, kernel has these enforced resource limits on a bunch of different things like memory. Uh, I forget which one it is here. R, R limit n proc the number of existing processes, which is a little bit weird, and it's a per user limit. So I think I set have it set to like ten or a hundred or some some manageable number. Uh, the, the the problem is by default R limit is there's there's no limit. It's just uncapped. So you can make a just a ridiculous number of processes. And uh, actually, the weird thing is that uh, for some reason process IDs are only a 16-bit signed number. So you only get 32,000 processes on the machine, and then trying to create more processes just crashes. In particular, the fork is going to return a negative number saying I couldn't manage to fork, but it'll keep trying. Yes. Great. When you get 32,000, you're at 20,000. Uh, it uh, the, the number wraps around. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so you can only have thirty-two thousand total running at a time. So you can see, like, as I, I, I actually okay. this, uh, I apparently I rebooted yesterday. This hang hung yesterday, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah anyway, so, so c c questions about uh, the forking? I mean, I wanted to just cover fork. We've covered mmap before, so I was thinking that would not be too terrifying. Ter terror alert level, where, where are we at? Maybe. I, 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 I think if I, if I can wrap this thing in a decent interface, I, I, should, uh, I should use y'all as guinea pigs like, to, uh, to uh, beta test my crazy new, new interfaces. So uh, honestly, threads look a lot better. Right? They have this nice standard thread interface. I think I could do, I could actually probably do exactly the same interface. It would be just explicitly shared, not uh, not implicitly sharing everything. I mean, the, the <clears throat> having a bare fork just hanging out there is, looks looks bad. I, I I don't know if there's any easy way I could make this run on Windows, but a lot of supercomputing gets uh, uh, has big problems with multiple thread, you know, uh, uh, multiple threads pounding on each other's stuff, and uh, it, uh, pretty much all supercomputers are running Linux, seems like. So, M might actually have uh, have some application. Questions? Does it, does it make sense what Fork is doing at all? So it's, it's, it's just copied the parent. It has copied the whole process, which is a weird. Well, it's it's uh, th th there's it's some genius there, honestly. The yeah. Well, it, it, in principle, it, it is a separate copy. Yeah. Uh, it's it's considered kind of a security problem if you you've got a big program like a web browser tab there's a bunch of sensitive data like your old passwords you used to log into this spot and then it forks to do something sort of dangerous like run a banner ad the problem is if if it forks without like getting rid of all the sensitive stuff in memory like even if there's like leftover like you you deleted it but it hasn't been unmapped then uh, you could get into big trouble. Like uh, that's that's definitely a sort of like uninitialized data is kind of a big mine, uh, uh, mineable source of uh, uh, information leaks. Uh, the, the, the usual thing to do after a fork is you call uh, you call the second uh, uh, the second half of it almost is uh, exec. <coughs> sure, uh, exec. So exec, and there's a bunch of uh, ways to call it. Basically, like you, you exec, uh, so, so the standard way to run a program in Unix is, can, is you fork to make a separate process. And then you exec to make the other copy of yourself be the new program you want to run. It's, it's a strange uh, two-way, like a, a fork, a fork and exec is, uh, and uh, yeah, honestly, this is, this is one of these design decisions that actually is it's just honestly it seems really beautiful to me. 
Uh, okay, so, so if, if you compare the Unix fork that takes no parameters at all, and, and, and it copies everything about the original. So if you want to change something about the child, you just change it in yourself, right? Uh, that's totally okay. Or, or you fork, and then you get control over the child. So, so for net run, right, what, what I want is I want to give you no rights at all, including the ability to like, have no rights. So I'm like root, I have like ch, I have like all sorts of rights. I fork, I keep like the, uh, the, the supervisor there that's gonna enforce the two second limit. Uh, it keeps running and it's actually sitting there doing a wait uh, and, and make sure you stay alive. And, uh, and then before I actually run your code, I go and I just give up all the, I tell the kernel like, don't trust me, don't trust anything I say. And uh, this is uh, t t totally easy to do. In, in, in Windows, it, when you call create process, like, the reason there's 10 parameters, and, and 10 is not enough, right, is because there's a million things you might want to change about the new process you're creating, right? You might want to change the security stuff about, like, what it's allowed to do, the how many threads it's allowed to have, whether it wants handles, what, uh, actually, this is like a set of flags, its environment variables, the directory it's in. Well, how do you change the directory in Unix? You fork, you CD, right? Just exactly the way you would change your own directory because you are the new process. It's, it's weird. Ah, yeah. And uh, there's there's a lot of moving parts there. <coughs> actually, this is one where... <laughs> Mark, how, how long did it take you to get create process actually to create a process? It's like a few days, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of frustrating. Of Half of these can be null, but yeah. the other half can't. The ones at the end in particular can't, can't be null, so... Yeah, uh, and, and uh, I don't know. It's funny because there's there's kind of this. Uh, shouldn't be saying this. Uh, there's emergent stupidity, right? You know, like emergent intelligence. There's also emergent stupidity, where a bunch of really smart people can collectively be really dumb. Microsoft definitely suffers from this because every person I know that actually works for Microsoft is a genius, and collectively they make some really bad decisions. Which, uh, yeah. Can we talk about how here's. Here's a bool, uh, a oh. bool macro, okay? Bool. bool. Yeah. The bool macro is not a bool. Yeah, you would think that would be lowercase bool, but it's not. It's It, it's, it predates the uh, the language bool, it turns out. But, uh, like, yeah. yeah. Usually usually when it says bool, it means it'll, like, like this will return zero or, like, a non-zero number. Mm. So it's like a... Int, I, like I think, is what it's... Uh, sense, no. but, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, Windows, I, I, I need to grok Windows better. You notice I'm back to Linux. Uh, I, I, I have a Windows machine. I, I was trying to use it for a few days, and I, I gave up, uh, for, for now at least. It, 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 it was stuff like, uh, th this is a, so LP Seaster. This is Hungarian notation, so long pointer. That's just a pointer. Uh, C is a, like a C string. So, so this essentially is just care pointer. It's the idea. The, the, the funny part is, uh, I was getting this compiler, like, error, you passed a variable of type care pointer, lowercase, the, and uh, the, per, the, the parameter expects care pointer, uppercase. I'm like, wait, care and care are apparently different. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but but it, it, generally, I think one of the reasons Unix is really uh, has been popular and has endured for these 40 years is because the APIs are really simple. They're like literally as simple as you can get while still being able to get done everything. Right? And uh, th th there's really an art to making uh, interfaces like that, the abstractions that let people do whatever they want and, and, and not just say like, and uh, I mean, create process takes 10 parameters. You'd think that would be enough. There's other things you want to do to processes that don't like, you know, but they're, they're not there yet. So now you need, you need an interface to say, do this obvious thing to my process and do it to that process as long as I have the authority to do it to that process, et cetera. Like it's, it's just a, it's, it's sort of an inherently easier way to architect the system if you are the process. So there's, there's lots of fewer interfaces all over. Yes. So if you create process, you're running some other program. So, so you tell it the exe to run. So if I want to fire off Notepad, or I want to fire off the code that uh, you all wrote, right? Your, your code is sitting there on disk, ready to go. 
I say start that code. The problem is there's, there's all sorts of things that go wrong here. Like uh, I fire up the program and then I c c quickly try and turn the switches off to like let it do with things. That's, that's, that's not going you know, to, there's, there's suddenly a race condition about like you're going to try and start up and try and kill me off before I can kill you off, right? And that, uh, that's no good. So you have uh, to make sure all the uh, like, uh, permissions and all that is set up before you actually start the other process. Yeah, and I, I think there's actually a flag where you can say start it, but don't start it. Or create it, but don't let it run yet. So then the kernel is like looking through its list of processes, and it's like, this one's ready to run, but wait, they told me not to run, so I guess I don't run it yet. And here's another whole opportunity for zombie type uh, things to happen. I mean, it, uh, uh, so, so honestly, I, I think this is one of the cases where basically, like, the, the fork approach, it looks really weird, uh, but uh, it's, it's actually a very clean way to make new processes.